please. Thank you. And the next item of business is Members' Business Debate on Motion 10464 in the name of Claire Hawkey on the Everyone's Business Campaign. And this debate will be concluded without any questions being put. May I ask those who wish to speak in the debate to please press the request to speak buttons. And I call on Claire Hawkey to open the debate for around seven minutes, please. Thank you very much, Presiding Officer. And firstly, I would like to thank the members who signed my motion welcoming the Everyone's Business Campaign to Scotland. The campaign is what, one which is incredibly personal to me, having been a mental health nurse for over 30 years and for the last 15 years actually specialising in perinatal mental health care itself. And on that note, I must refer members to my entry in the Register of Interests in that I currently hold, I am currently a registered mental health nurse and hold an honorary contract with NHS Greater Glasgow and Clyde. Presiding officer, I will be delighted to welcome a number of people to the gallery this afternoon. Um, we will be joined by a number of the change agents, as well as some of Scotland's most talented mental health professionals, from league nurses to consultant perinatal psychiatrists and consultant clinical psychologists, and I sincerely hope they enjoy their visit to Parliament. Among them is an individual without whom perinatal mental health services in Scotland would not be where they are today, and for that we all owe him a huge debt of gratitude, Dr Rock Cantwell. Dr Cantwell's passion in this area has ensured that many mothers, their infants and their families have received the specialist care that they need and deserve. And finally, I would like to pay tribute to the Everyone Business Campaign Coordinator for Scotland, Joanne Smith, for her work and drive in ensuring this campaign is raised in Parliament. Presiding Officer, our debate this afternoon could not be more timely. We're in the middle of this year's Mental Health Awareness Week and at a time when mental health is at the forefront of the public's thoughts. And although most will be aware of the shocking statistic that suicide is the biggest killer of men aged under 45, it is probably a lesser known fact that it is also the leading cause of direct maternal deaths within a year of childbirth. Perinatal mental health problems are sadly all too common, with estimates ranging from between 10 and 20% of women developing an illness in the first postnatal year, and one in seven of those hiding or underplaying its severity. Across the UK, mental illness in pregnant and postnatal women often goes unrecognised, undiagnosed and untreated, with many mothers suffering in silence. The Everyone's Business campaign is therefore calling for all women across the UK who experience perinatal mental health problems to receive the care they and their families crucially need, wherever and whenever they need it. Presiding officer, the campaign is built on three main themes. Accountability for perinatal mental health care should be clearly set nationally and complied with. Community specialist mental health teams meeting national quality standards should be available for women in every area of the UK. And training in perinatal mental health care should be delivered to all professionals involved in the care of women during pregnancy and the first year after birth. The campaign recently published a UK-wide map which categorised the different levels of specialist perinatal mental health community teams. These included so-called red areas where no specialist team exists, pink areas where some extremely basic level of provision exists, amber areas where basic level of provision exists but currently falls short of the national standards and needs expanding, and finally green areas where women and families can access treatment that meets nationally agreed standards. And whilst this might not be a compre comprehensive community care across the country which is reflected in the map, that's not to say that there are no services available at all. There are dedicated professionals across many services throughout Scotland, ensuring that mothers, their children and their families can access help. Every health board in Scotland, bar two, has direct access to one of the two mother and baby units in Scotland, whilst the two exceptions can access this care when it's required. And a service which I'm very proud to have worked in prior to my election is the perinatal mental health provision in Greater Glasgow and Clyde, which is categorised as the highest level in the Everyone's Business map. However, the report and I acknowledge that we can do more across Scotland. In 2017, the Scottish Government, with the UK's first ever Minister for Mental Health, sought to address these disparities by launching the new Scottish Managed Clinical Care Network for Perinatal Mental Health to identify gaps in provision of care and promote improvements in local services, 
And this new network is an excellent start to ensuring that every woman in her family who requires help with perinatal mental health problems receive prompt, effective care from professionals who are skilled to meet their needs. Presiding officer, although not fully there yet, as an RMN of over 30 years, I cannot overstate how far our mental health services have come in that time. When I started nursing, mental health hospitals were on the periphery of our society, quite literally on the outskirts of towns and cities, and there were few community services available. Now community mental health services are the norm. There are liaison psychiatry in our acute hospitals, and crisis and home treatment teams can be found in most areas of the country. As clinical nurse manager of the perinatal mental health service, I was part of the team who helped to set up the mother and baby unit in Glasgow in 2004, the first of its kind in Scotland. All this and the continual work to end stigma has ensured our services, our treatment and the prevention of mental illness is constantly improving. Presiding officer, I've cared for so many women over the years suffering from a range of illnesses, including depression and anxiety after having a baby many of whom had lost all confidence in their self and their ability to be a good enough parent. But after some treatment and support, they have got back to health. I often reflect on the words of one particular mum who gave me a card after her care and treatment came to a close. And it read, I've spent weeks looking for a gift that shows my appreciation for all you've done for me. Nothing I could find seemed good enough. So I'm trying to find the words in this card to repay you. You've given me back my life. You've knitted my family back together again. And I can now go on with being a mum, the mum I want to be to my children. I believe these words show exactly why these services are so important. As a perinatal nurse, I feel very privileged to have worked with mums, their infants and their families at a very special time in their life, the time when their baby's been born. It's a very special area of mental health care and one I'm very passionate about. And I'm sure other health and social care professionals who work in the field feel likewise. It shows why perinatal mental health care is so important. President officer, perinatal mental health care is everyone's business. And until the time that those mums who experience mental health problems receive the care that they and their families need, wherever and whenever they need it, we still have work to do. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Hawking. We move to the open debate. Speeches of up to four minutes, please. And I call Annie Wells to be followed by Ruth Maguire. Thank you, Deputy Presiding Officer. And I want to thank Claire Hawkey for bringing this debate forward today, especially during Mental Health Awareness Week, and to offer my support to the Everyone's Business campaign. I'd also like to welcome those in the gallery today as well. With more than one in 10 women developing a mental health problem during pregnancy or within the first year of having a baby, I strongly believe that this is still a topic not nearly spoken about enough. We all know people who have struggled after the birth of a child. After having my son 24 years ago, I, like many young mothers, found myself in a situation where I felt alone, isolated, and wasn't sure if I was doing the right thing. I continually questioned my actions and felt that everyone else seemed to know better. And no matter how much I beat myself up or questioned myself, I didn't want to say to anyone that I, I wasn't coping. However, having spoken to friends and family and looking back, it seems that this is how a lot of people feel. And I am pleased to see that it is now being discussed more openly. And this is exactly why I too welcome the introduction of Maternal Mental Health Alliance's campaign here in Scotland one that seeks to improve access to specialist perinatal mental health services so that women can receive the care they and their families need wherever and whenever they need it. We know services are falling short of the standard required and only last month data analysed by the MMHA from 2017 showed that women had no specialist care in seven out of the 14 health boards warning that women were facing a postcode lottery in accessing life-saving care. We know what the costs are when adequate support is not provided. Suicide remains the leading cause of death for women in the perinatal period, and the impact of undiagnosed or untreated illnesses can be devastating for families. Although I welcome the commitment to introduce a managed clinical network, I want there to be a view to expand and improve antenatal and postnatal mental health services 
so that we get it right for every mother. When we know that seven in 10 women will hide or underplay the severity of their perinatal mental health problem, it's also important that on top of improving service provision, we break down barriers when it comes to talking about mental health. Last month, I was lucky enough to visit Quarriers in the heart of Glasgow's East End to see the perinatal mental health support it provides and its purpose-built family resource centre. Based in the community, the facility created a comfortable space in which mothers could talk openly about issues they were having and know that they weren't alone. I was encouraged to hear from staff in the centre that the resource is well utilised and it's also great to see these services being delivered locally and within the heart of the community. This is something I would like to see replicated across the city and indeed Scotland, showing that perinatal mental health is something we can all speak about without any stigma or feelings of self-doubt. And on that point, it was positive to hear that NHS Greater Glasgow and Clyde have met national guidelines on service provision set out by the Royal College of Psychiatrists. With them being clearly focused on delivering for service users, this gives us a greater chance of succeeding in assisting every mother. All stakeholders locally and nationally need to play their part and the NHS are right at the heart of the strategy going forward. I hope that they continue to hit these guidelines and we have a duty to ensure that these guidelines are monitored regularly. To finish today, Deputy President Officer, I would again like to echo my support for this campaign. This is a subject that needs to be brought more to the public's attention and I hope across the Chamber that many personal speeches today will help achieve this. We must create a society where mothers feel able to share their experiences rather than feel that they have to hide away, which is why I hope more resource will be put towards services that reach out to mothers who find themselves affected. Thank you. I call Ruth McGuire to be followed by Anna Sarwar. Presiding officer, I congratulate Claire Hockey on bringing this important debate on perimental perinatal mental health to the Chamber and would like to acknowledge her significant experience and expertise on the topic. I'd also like to thank Aber Lauer, the Everyone's Business Campaign and Spice for their briefing materials prior to the debate. Perinatal mental health issues are estimated to affect up to 1 in 10 women during pregnancy. I support the call of the Everyone's Business Campaign for all women who experience perinatal mental health problems to receive the care that they and their families need wherever and whenever they need it. I believe that the establishment of a national managed clinic network on perinatal mental health, the first MCN covering mental health in Scotland, is a good sign of the Scottish Government's determination to give mental health parity alongside physical health. These clinical networks operate in other parts of the health service and they have a proven track record for driving up standards of care. Good perinatal maternal mental health is vitally important in improving outcomes for mothers and their young children. Poor maternal mental health can impact significantly on child development outcomes if untreated. It can impact on a child's emotional, cognitive and even physical development. And whilst that's not inevitable, the consequences can be serious and potentially lifelong. This is why the Scottish Government funded MCN on perinatal mental health is so important. The MCN brings together specialists on perinatal mental health, nursing, maternity and infant mental health um, practitioners who are currently as assessing current provisions across all levels of service delivery in Scotland and in the longer term ensuring all women, their infants and their families importantly have equity of access to the perinatal mental health services they need across Scotland. With all we know about the importance of early development on a child's life, intervention and support at the earliest possible stage can have a really positive impact and can prevent or mitigate issues later on. I wholeheartedly agree that there's a way to go in both raising awareness of the issue of perinatal mental health, which I'm actually struggling to say, presiding officer, it's not an easy word to say. <laughs> so there's a... <laughs> yes. Fulton McGregor, are you going to teach her how to say it? <laughs> no, uh, no. <laughs> I thank the colleague for taking my, uh, my intervention. She's aware of my campaign to increase paternity leave 
uh, up to four weeks um, for organisations in the public sector. Does she think that this uh, might, might be helpful in helping women who are struggling in the, the early days? Ruth Maguire. I thank Fulton McGregor for that intervention and a chance for me to put my teeth back in. Um, absolutely, I think that, that children having both their parents around in the, in the early years is, is good for mum, good for dad, good for baby, good, good for everybody. So I would, I would wholeheartedly um, support his, his campaign. Um, the most effective work um, will be done in partnership across local authority, health, third sectors, and of course, perinatal mental health services. Those services straddling both adult and child um, services means that the investment that you make protects two generations at once, supporting child development outcomes and improving maternal mental health. It's work that will ultimately prevent unnecessary suffering for women and families and both improves child children's early experiences and removes future pressures. There's an obvious human cost of undiagnosed or untreated illness. And additionally, if these mental health problems were identified and treated quickly and effectively, serious and sometimes life-changing human and economic costs could be avoid, avoided. I think we probably all agree in this chamber that we want Scotland to be the best place to grow up and addressing perinatal mental health issues effectively, addressing them as early as possible, is just one of the things that we can do to help make that aspiration a reality. Let's pledge to do all we can to make perinatal mental health everyone's business. Anna Sarwire, followed by Alex Cole Hamilton. Thank you, Deputy President Officer. Can I start by congratulating Claire Hockey on bringing forward this important debate, particularly as we are in uh, Mental Health Awareness Week? Can I thank um, the charity, everyone's business campaign, um, all the campaigners, all clinicians, and indeed all charities involved in mental health for all their efforts, not just this week, but all their efforts throughout uh, the year. Um, specifically on perinatal mental health, I think it's important to recognise um, that this is about supporting an individual, yes, but it's about supporting that individual because the impacts of perinatal mental health issues will impact with them for the rest of their lives. Impact on their family life, impact on their social life, impact on their working life, and crucially impact on their children as well. So it's about health outcomes for the mother, but actually also health and life outcomes for the child too. And that's why this is so uh, important. That's why we need access to specialist service. That's why we need access to wraparound services. But to make that happen, we need to have a change of culture and a change we think about how we think about mental health. And I'll tell you what I mean by that. We often say in the statistics that one in three of us as a population will have a mental health issue at some point in our lives. I prefer to think about it that every single one of us is on a spectrum of mental health throughout our lives. And I think if we think about it that way, it can help us change the culture in terms of where the resource goes, in terms of where the workforce goes, and how we address not just the stigma, but actually back up uh, that commitment to tackle mental health with the services uh, that we need. Uh, so that involves perinatal uh, mental health services. That means antenatal uh, depression, postnatal depression, anxiety, post-traumatic disorders, all support uh, that women need. But actually, we should look at it in different places as well. So one is looking at perinatal mental health straight after a child uh, is born. But actually, when that woman goes back into the workplace, what is happening in the workplace, so how we have better access to mental health services um, in the workplace, um, if that woman is back in a university or college sector, how do we give them better support in our university and college sector with better access uh, to mental health services? But I think there's a specific challenge around crisis services, and I think we heard that from First Minister's questions as well. Um, I think if you are asking people to wait days on end to see a GP, and then sometimes weeks, if not months on end, to see a counsellor or a psychologist, for many people that time difference can literally be life or death literally be life or death um, and if we look at another way if someone breaks their leg they will be seen by an A&E within four hours but they can't lose their life hopefully they wouldn't lose their life by breaking their leg but if someone was to have a serious crisis mental health issue and they're not seen quickly that could mean the end of their life so we need to change the culture of how we have crisis centers and I think looking at crisis centers and backing that with resource is really really important and then how you have care in the community so one is how you have direct services, whether that's in an acute setting, whether that's in a primary care setting, whether that's access to a counsellor through your workplace, through a college university campus, um, or indeed an emergency service um, through a crisis centre. 
but actually in the community having genuine local crisis teams that identifies individuals who need that support, who need that rapid support, I think is really important. I read one case yesterday uh, about someone who tried to access a local crisis team in the local community, had a history of mental health issues um, and was turned away. And four hours later, the police picked that person up from a well-known suicide site at a bridge uh, in the west of Scotland. Um, that, I think, gives us a stark example of how we need a better thinking in terms of our crisis teams. And alongside that, it means the workforce. So how do we have more clinical psychologists? How do we have more counsellors in all those places to support individuals, uh, perinatal women, as well as women throughout their lives, and indeed all our citizens throughout their life. Um, so I welcome uh, the Everybody's Business campaign. I thank Clare Hockey for bringing forward this debate, and I would hope this parliament as a collective can work to put mental health, uh, give it the priority it needs, and back up with services, back up with resources, and back up with the workforce too. Thank you. I call Alex Paul Hamilton to be followed by Alison Johnson. Thank you very much, Deputy Presiding Officer. I'd like to start by echoing the thanks of the Chamber, both to Claire Hohey and to the Everyone's Business Campaign for securing parliamentary time for us to debate this important issue today. Welcome to the best club in the world. Your life is going to change, but only in good, word, in good ways. These are some of the utterances that come from society whenever you're expecting a, a child. And it's not surprising then that with such a weight of societal expectation around pregnancy and parenthood, that it's very difficult for mothers to come forward and admit that they're not necessarily coping or not enjoying things in the way that they thought they might. And, and it, yet, for all too many mothers, that is the reality. It is, as such, a hidden issue very much in our mental health landscape, and I'm very glad we are airing it today, because like many other mental health issues, it is a spectrum. You can have it very severely or, or very mildly. It can be anxiety or depression. It can be OCD and leading to post-traumatic stress disorder and, and real psychosis in, in some extreme cases. It happens during pregnancy or after pregnancy. And I want to take a moment to recognize a group that isn't often mentioned in debates like this. And that, that's for uh, those who miscarry. Because uh, my sister, Ro, who's in the gallery uh, this afternoon, is one such person. She miscarried in 2016 and then suffered mental health issues directly after. And she's allowed me to share her words with the chamber this afternoon. She said, it hurts so much along with the feelings of guilt and failure at not successfully bringing my baby into the world, there was a chemical change that I didn't understand or expect. Rosie is among many mothers who, and or would be mothers who suffer in this way and we need to do far, far more for them. It is that tension between the stigma of not wanting to put your hand up and say that you're not coping, which gets in the way of identification. It's why that first six week check that every mother, new mother goes through uh, is all important, but it means nothing if our doctors, our midwives, our health visitors are not adequately trained in understanding what those early warning signs are for, for people that aren't, just aren't coping or, or might need a little bit of extra support. That's why we, we urgently need to rectify that to make it as a matter of course that people are adequately trained in perinatal mental health issues. But once we identify these women, and we do them a profound disservice if we can't stand that recognition up with adequate service provisions in the communities and in the hospitals in their locale. And we know that not only, uh, less than half of mothers are served by adequate perinatal mental health facilities or services either in their communities or local hospitals. I am uh, intensely proud to have been involved with Abelara at the time that they started their perinatal befriending service in Forth Valley and all told that has helped 160 mothers in that area since it started three years ago but there's no guarantee that they will be able to sustain that when the funding goes and we need actually to mainstream services like that right across the family so uh, the country so that there isn't that postcode lottery but the worst, I think, comes when we talk about inpatient provision, because we in this country have only 12 beds on any given day available to mothers and their babies to come in for perinatal mental health support, 12 beds. If those beds are full, mothers are directed to adult services and they can't take their babies with them. So not only are we compounding mental turmoil of the, the chemical changes going on in their brains, but we're compounding that with the separation anxiety of having to remove a child from the, the situation as well. It, it's, it, this has to be the nexus of where we take this agenda. It, it is absolutely critical. 
So I want to finish by once again thanking Claire Hawkey for this time to, to raise this debate um, and for the campaign because I think it's very easy for us to let these women drift back into the shadows and just try and muddle through and carry on regardless. But they are, they are looking to this chamber for answers and it's time we woke up to that. Thank you. Alison Johnson followed by Rona Mackay. Thank you, Presiding Officer, and I too thank Claire Hawhey for securing this debate um, and the Maternal Health Alliance for their campaign for mental, perinatal mental health care and treatment, um, and on all the organisations who work in this important area. And I would also like to thank colleagues um, whose contributions have been passionate um, and sensitive today. Like all members, I was glad to see a managed clinical network for perinatal mental health established, but it is clear there is much more to be done. Women are more likely to experience severe mental health problems following childbirth than at any other time in their life. Though we know that up to one in five women may experience some kind of mental health problem during pregnancy or in the first year of their child's life, mental health difficulties go undiagnosed and untreated for too many women. Prioritising maternal mental health is a preventative approach to mental health because we know that the mental health of mothers and new parents is such an important factor in children's development, in their well-being, and their own mental health in later life. In his review of NHS targets, Harry Burns advocated a life course approach to planning health services. And this means acting more in early life to support people in the long term. It's about teacher training. It's about training the early years workforce we're trying to attract. Investment in maternal mental health is an investment in infant mental health. But the support we offer families at this crucial time is lacking. And the Royal College of Midwives have said we're also lagging behind England and Wales in making improvements. It's concerning that only one health board in Scotland has a specialised perinatal community team that reaches the Royal College of Psychiatrists perinatal quality standards type one. And to be clear, in the Royal College of Psychiatrists view, failing to meet these standards is a threat to patient safety and rights and may even breach the law. And while it's clear that there is very good work going on in parts of Scotland, um, as colleagues, including Annie Wells, have noticed, noted seven health boards in Scotland offer no specialist community perinatal mental health care at all. The Mental Welfare Commission has also found that some women who would have benefited from specialist inpatient care in a mother and baby unit felt that the units were simply too far away from home. The travel and disruption to their wider family life was too challenging at a time when they were already in severe distress. So we must think seriously about how to improve provision for women who are not close to Livingston or Glasgow. And I know the Managed Clinical Network have been looking at this and I'd be grateful if the Minister could comment in closing. Bliss have also stressed the need for better mental health support for parents whose babies are cared for in neonatal units. This is an incredibly anxious time for parents and they need access to psychological support. And the links, of course, between financial stress and mental health problems can't be overstated. I very much welcome the new neonatal care fund to ease financial pressures for, patient, for parents whose babies are in hospital. But we must also ensure that the basics are in place for all new families. Starting a family or having another child means huge change for most families' financial circumstances. For those on low incomes, the prospect of long periods on statutory maternity pay, navigating the benefit system and paying for childcare can be, quite frankly, terrifying. Parliament has shown the will to tackle child poverty. We've put targets to reduce child poverty back in place. And I'm pleased the government has listened to green calls to roll out healthier, wealthier children. This is an income maximisation approach that really works. In Lothian, the region I represent, family-friendly um, advice and Healthy Start projects are really helping boost the incomes of young families um, here in this city and beyond. There have been other positive steps too, like the new Best Start grant. But there's no room for complacency. Child poverty is predicted to rise. This will have an impact on maternal mental health. I mean, the IFS predict that nearly 30% of children in Scotland will live in poverty by 2021. That financial stress for parents can have a serious impact on their mental health. I look forward to working with colleagues to improve perinatal mental health in Scotland. And I look forward to the Minister's response to the challenges we face in delivering this. Thank you.
Uh, before I call Ms Mackay, uh, there are still a few members who wish to speak, so I'm minded to accept a motion under Rule 8.14.3 to extend the debate by no more than 30 minutes. Can I ask Claire Hockey to move such a motion? I move. Thank you. Are members all in agreement? As there's no disagreement, I extend the debate under Standing Order Rule 8.14.3 and I call Rona Mackay to be followed by Michelle Ballantyne. Thank you, Presiding Officer. I too would like to thank Claire Hoey for her bringing this very important subject to the Chamber and for a really informative and moving opening speech. I thank her because this is an issue which is rarely discussed and it should be because it affects a lot of women, more than one in ten as we've heard. Pregnancy is traditionally portrayed as a happy, joyful time in a woman's life. People say things like, you're radiant, you're blooming, and all the rest of it. And for many women, that is true. They revel in this, this amazing chapter of their life, feeling fulfilled, happy and well, if a little exhausted towards the end. But for others, as we've heard, it's just not like that. As the motion states, more than one in 10 women develop a mental health, a mental illness during pregnancy or within the first year of having a child, exactly when you need your health and energy most. They often pretend everything is all right as they don't want to seem weird or different because of societal pressure, as Alex Cole Hamilton articulated. That's why the campaign Everyone's Business is so important. It raises awareness of these issues. It says it's okay to not be okay and you're not alone. The fact that his Ill this illness often goes undiagnosed and untreated has a devastating effect on, the women, on women and family and friends. However, there, there is patchy provision of specialist care throughout the UK, and like Claire Hawley and others, I'm glad that this is now recognised in the Scottish Government's mental health strategy by funding a £173,000 perinatal managed clinical network, which will involve training midwives, health visitors, primary care and mental health professionals, so that women know that there will be help when they most need it, no matter where in Scotland they live because there should not be a postcode lottery in, in an issue as important as this. It is everyone's business. The campaign Sign 127, the National Clinical Guideline on Managing Perinatal Mood Disorders, presents a vision of what a world-class service for perinatal mental health would look like. Scotland has committed to implement the Sign 127 guideline on managing perinatal mood disorders and has prioritised perinatal mental health in the best start for the maternity and neonatal care plan for Scotland. The gaps in specialist perinatal mental health services in Scotland must be closed and I believe the government has taken the first steps to address that. An example of great practice is Aberlour Children's Charity who believe in early intervention and I thank them for their briefing. They point out that not all children are born equal and since 2014 Aberlour has been providing perinatal support services across Forth Valley and this year we'll ex they'll expand on provision to support mums and their families in East Lothian. They also run a befriending support service to provide intensive community-based one-to-one support throughout pregnancy and during the first year of a child's life. By matching each mum with a befriender, the service aims to improve mental health and well-being, increase confidence in parenting and reduce social isolation and support access to wider community supports and resources. They also believe that acknowledging the importance of the father, partner or any other existing supportive relationship in the lives of expectant new mums is essential, which fits entirely with Fulton McGregor's campaign for uh, parental leave. <laughs> Presiding officer, nothing is more important than our health and the health of our future generation. It is incumbent on each and every one of us to recognise the signs of perinatal and postnatal illness and to offer support to those who are suffering. We do not live in the dark ages, so let's not be kept in the dark about this most serious of issues. Thank you. Call Michelle Ballantyne to be followed by Mary Fee. Ah, point of order, Alex Cole Hamilton. <laughs> I'm terribly sorry, Deputy Presiding Officer. I neglected to refer members to my register of interest that I was an employee of Abelara for eight years prior to coming here. I should have re rectified that. Sorry. No, thank you very much for putting that in the record, Mr Cole Hamilton. And I'm sure everyone in the chamber will forgive you. <laughs> Michelle Ballantyne followed by Mary Fee. Thank you, presiding officer. And I also want to add my thanks to Claire for bringing this, this debate forward. It is a really important subject. So why is perinatal health everyone's business? Latest statistics suggest that everyone will know someone with an experience of perinatal mental health problems, be it a mother, sister, aunt, cousin or friend. Our future is vested in the well-being of children and therefore in their mothers. 
There is a saying that it takes a village to raise a child, and that sentiment is particularly important with perinatal health. Is it therefore really acceptable that seven out of 14 health boards in Scotland offer no specialist care? At present, without specialist perinatal services, it falls to GPs to detect signs of maternal mental health problems. But how can we expect a doctor to identify and treat the often well-hidden symptoms of mental health issues, often of, of an individual they have never met before? I know from personal experience how important a well-established relationship with your GP can be in identifying when something's not right. It was at a routine visit to my own GP following the birth of my fifth child that she asked me just how I was, sorry, asked me just as I was preparing to leave how I was feeling. My initial quick response of fine was soon followed by a flood of tears when her concern cut through my collected exterior. My GP's knowledge of me caught my postnatal depression early and allowed a quick and effective intervention that saved me and my family from what might have been a very difficult time. Of course, we know that the go-to solution for mental ill health these days is often antidepressants. New mothers, whether it is their first child or fifth, are dealing with both physical and emotional change, and some will require a pharmacological intervention, but this should not be the first step. There needs to be prioritized investment in appropriate specialist services. If perinatal mental health problems are identified and treated quickly and effectively, then serious human and economic costs for the whole country could be avoided. Not getting this right not only impacts on maternal mental health, but also children's future outcomes, pressure on our health services and on mothers' abilities to return to work. While I welcome the fact that the Scottish Government has made commitments to improve services, there still exists an unacceptable postcode lottery for mothers across the country. Of course, the issue often underpinning all of this is funding. Why is it then, I ask, that increased funding received through the Barnett formula has not been ring-fenced in Scotland as it has in England and Wales? Our perinatal mental health services are now failing to keep up with those south of the border, and this means that mothers and their children in Scotland are being failed. Perinatal mental health service sorry, mental health straddles both adult and child mental health services. We know that poor mental health can significantly impact on child development outcomes and significantly limit children's life chances. And if the Scottish Government <coughs> is serious about closing the attainment gap, then perinatal mental health must be addressed. There is a real requirement for significantly more joined up thinking when it comes to the provision of our health services here in Scotland. Investment in perinatal mental health is exactly that, an investment. It is estimated that failing to do so costs public services five times more downstream, but that is nothing compared to the human cost and suffering. Long-term investment and long-term planning will be vital in combating the far-reaching human and economic consequences of perinatal mental health. I hope the managed clinical networks will now start delivering the resources for appropriate services. However, we also need champions, individuals like Claire Hockey, but also individuals like Claire Grieve, a midwife at the Borders General Hospital. Claire recently received the Chairman's Award at the NHS Borders Celebrating Excellence Awards for her outstanding work in improving perinatal health services in the borders. The birth of a child should be the most wonderful experience, yet so many new mothers struggle. We have come a long way, but the journey isn't finished. If it takes a village to raise a child, then perinatal health really is everyone's business. Thank you. And the last of the open debate contributions is from Mary Fee. Thank you, Deputy Presiding Officer, and I welcome the opportunity to speak in this afternoon's Members Debate on the Everyone's Business campaign. And can I too thank Claire Hockey for securing today's debate. Mental health problems affect everyone, directly or indirectly. And the campaign on perinatal mental health raises specific issues that must be addressed for the sake of pregnant women, for new mothers, for their children and for their wider family. As many as 10 to 20 per cent of women face a period of mental health illness either during pregnancy or in the first year after birth. And organisations involved in the care of perinatal health warn that rates of detection and appropriate intervention are still low. 
The Maternal Mental Health Alliance have drawn up a map of health boards across Scotland to illustrate the level of care and service available to pregnant women and new mothers by each health board. And it is shocking, and it was a point very well made by Alison Johnson, that only one health board has a specialised perinatal community team meeting the perinatal quality network standards type one, and that is NHS Greater Glasgow and Clyde. And even more shocking is that seven of the country's health board regions have no provision for perinatal mental health care. And the Royal College of Psychiatrists have warned that the failure to meet these standards is a significant threat of patient safety, of patient rights, and of patient dignity. And most, if not all, mothers will experience that express train of emotions that hurtle towards them after they give birth. And how we support women after giving birth is crucial for their long-term well-being. And Deputy Presiding Officer, I welcome the commitment and the action taken by the Scottish Government to introduce a managed clinical network. This was an action set out in the Mental Health Strategy 2017 to 2027, and I am glad that there has been positive action, which will help to improve the care, the support, and the lives of pregnant women and new mothers. And I look forward to further progress being made in the support offered to women affected by poor mental health, and will continue to monitor the progress of the government's mental health strategy and offer any help that I can to ensure that people are not being failed when it comes to mental health. And Deputy Presiding Officer, although today's focus is on pregnant women and new mothers, there is a case to be made to include women suffering from fertility problems. As many as one in six couples experience some form of infertility. And for many, the effects of this can cause prolonged mental health problems. I know of a constituent who was diagnosed with depression because of her difficulty in becoming pregnant. And a huge concern and worry for her was that her mental health problems would continue into a successful pregnancy and the risk of postnatal depression after birth was always in her mind. And thankfully, this was not the case. And, and however, a, a focus of early intervention for women going through fertility treatment would be beneficial as they become pregnant and after the birth of their child. And in closing, Deputy Presiding Officer, can I once again thank Claire Hockey for the debate today and extend my support to the Everybody's Business campaign to, support, to, to secure better maternity mental health for mothers, for the child and for the wider family. Thank you. <laughs> I now call Maureen Watt to respond to the debate for around seven minutes, please, Minister. Thank you very much, uh, Presiding Officer. And I'd like to begin by commending Claire Hawley for bringing this motion to the Chamber today and indeed her knowledge and expertise in this area with her. And I'd also like to welcome the change agents and Rock Cantwell and others to the gallery today. We all aspire that mental health should get the attention and sustained discussion that it deserves. And I thank all the members for their contributions and sharing their experiences. Over the past while, whether through press coverage, passionate campaigning, parliamentary activity or elsewhere, we have heard about the priority and fundamental importance of perinatal mental health. Just on Monday of this week, I spoke at the Maternal Mental Health Scotland's annual conference on this very issue. We have momentum, which we must keep going. And the Everyone's Business campaign has played a significant part in ensuring that this happens. This is in the wider context of it being, of course, Mental Health Awareness Week and, of course, the Year of Young People. All of this work and all of these opportunities can together make a real and tangible difference to the profile of issues like perinatal mental health. Ultimately, we want that raised profile to result in better support for women and a more sophisticated understanding of the issues at population level across Scotland. And Annie Wells talked about what is available in her area in terms 
um, of the Quarriers Centre. Uh, others talked about the Aberlour project. Indeed, there's the Juno project here uh, in Edinburgh too. And Annie Wells and Ruth Maguire and others have talked about the importance of partnership working. It's not always about a kind of medicalised mod model. It is that partnership working and the support we can offer uh, each other in, uh, in the community. So as well as focusing on the importance of good perinatal mental health in general, Hockey, Clear Hockey's motion is, of course, in support of the Everyone's Business campaign. <clears throat> and the campaign calls for all women who experience perinatal mental health problems to receive the care they and their families need wherever and whenever they need it. The evidence in support of this is persuasive. We know that between 10 and 15% of women who give birth will suffer from anxiety or depression during pregnancy and the first year. And this equates to between 5,500 5, and 8,000 women each year. Furthermore, we know that in two of every five households with a new baby, at least one parent suffers from depression or anxiety. To quote the Royal College of General Practitioners, up to one in five women are affected by mental health problems in the perinatal period. And fortunately, only 50% of those are diagnosed. Without appropriate treatment, the negative impact of mental health problems during the perinatal period is enormous and can have long lasting consequences, not only on women, but their partners and children too. And as others have said, mental health, ill health is the second leading cause of maternal death after cardiovascular disease. Treating maternal mental health problems is not only good for the women affected, it's good for their babies too, the intergeneral, intergenerational um, <coughs> thing that uh, I think Claire, uh, uh, Ruth McGuire mentioned. And it will contribute to breaking the cycle of poor outcomes from early mental health adversity. All of this is why we have prioritised perinatal mental health in our 10-year mental health strategy. Two of the key themes of the strategy are prevention and early intervention, and also improving access to treatment and joined up as accessible services. And that's why we've provided funding of £173,000 per year for the perinatal mental health managed clinical network. And it's why we funded the network, this network at nearly double the usual level for MCNs, allowing it to bring together specialists not only on perinatal mental health, but nursing, maternity and infant mental health too. The network has this long-term ambition, which I have no doubt we all support, that all women, their infants and families have equity of access to the perinatal mental health services they need across all of Scotland. Just, can I just finish on that one? We want there to be a focus on prevention and early intervention that spans the whole range of the early years, starting from preconception through infancy and into the school years. And our aspirations apply equally across the police. And I will make sure that the MCN, uh, if they're not already doing so, take into account miscarriage and fertility problems that two members have mentioned. Anna Sauer. I thank the Minister for that intervention. She says we have the aspiration, it's a shared aspiration. Can we then have a timeline on when we expect every health board to have access to these services, not just half the health boards? What's the timeline? Maureen Watt. I'll come on to that. <clears throat> so the focus of the perinatal mental health MCN is not just about what we normally expect MCNs to do to, you know, for professionals to talk and share good practice um, across their work. The work of the network, the work the network is currently doing across Scotland involves all health boards and, all, and includes third sector organisations as well as the voices of families in the work they are doing. We want an approach in Scotland that's based on the most thorough understanding possible of the picture across the country. It's not just about which areas have specialist services, although of course that is crucial and we know that. It's about what's available across the spectrum of need. And that spans from universal education and awareness raising 
through to those specialist services which are so vital when mental health does Ill, when mental illness does occur and that's why continued involvement of the third sector and universal services is going to be so important as we move forward and this is all in the context of integration authorities remaining responsible for the commissioning of community and mental health services including perinatal uh, perinatal services and they will all continue to have uh, a central role. So our next step and the investment will be guided by the MCN's ongoing work to build that full picture of current provision in Scotland and I wasn't going to mention what's going on in England but while they have put in investment I have heard quite a lot of criticism about the fact that they think in England they're doing it the wrong way around and we are doing it the right way around. So I'm looking forward to the MCN's conference next month to say exactly, and they will tell us exactly what they have been doing and what they will be doing in the future. And that will influence what we do going forward. Um, and I think it's a, it's a, it, it is the involvement of women in their families that's crucial. It's the work that we can all do together that will ensure everyone can access the support they need. And I'm not going to give Anis Sarwar a timeline here today till I, till I know exactly what is required, where it is required, and take the advice of experts who, to tell us what exactly to do. Because it is important that we get this right from the beginning and not waste very scarce resources which they are seem to be doing in England. So we've got to make sure that it's about all the service and it's a cross-government approach, as Claire has said. So I'd like to close by thanking Claire Hockey for bringing this motion to the Chamber this afternoon. And I offer my very best wishes to the continued success of the Everyone's Business campaign, which is doing such important work. It is everyone's business, but I can assure everyone here, it's certainly mine. That concludes the debate and the meeting is suspended until 2.30pm.